Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next lecture in our video series discussing acid-base equilibrium, where we are now focusing on buffer solutions. So we're going to continue talking about acid-base conjugates for weak dissociating species, its relationship, their relationship to KW, or the weak dissociation of water into its respective acidic and basic particle. And then we're going to talk about how all of this is useful to us by looking at how acid-base titrations proceed and why the titration curves we've generated in the lab thus far look the way they do. So let's begin with a refresher on conjugates. So when we talk about conjugate pairs, we are looking for a set of substances that when dissolved in solution, exists because one thing was dissolved, right? Like one thing comes from another, they're associated conjugates. And in an acid-base context, our conjugate pairs are things where like, if you dissolve an acid, you result in creating some kind of thing that can act as a base. So let's look at the weak acid HF. So if I were to look at the acid dissociation, equation of hydrofluoric acid, I would have HF being dissolved in water, which in solution establishes a dissociation equilibrium to generate the acidic hydronium ion and the fluoride anion. And the way that we have thought about our conjugates is by thinking about the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Of acids and bases. So in the forward reaction, I see that hydrofluoric acid is an acid because it donates H plus. To H2O. making this a Bronsted-Lowry acid. And if I look at the reverse reaction, we see that the fluoride ion, which is present in solution because of the dissociation of HF, can be reprotonated by the hydronium ion to form our reactants. So in the reverse reaction, the hydronium acid can reprotonate the fluoride ion. So if the fluoride ion is taking in an acidic H+, this means that this is our Bronsted-Lowry base, which means this is our conjugate base. Of HF. So we have conjugate pairs because we had some weak dissociating substance in solution that because of its dissociation now created something that did the opposite. Meaning so like if we dissolved a weak acid, we have now put in something that can act as a Bronsted-Lowry base. This is according to, again, thinking about like the Bronsted-Lowry proton donation exception process. But that's not all there is when it comes to like identifying a conjugate base. So recall, bases are not only things that accept proton in reaction, right? Bases must increase the concentration of hydroxide ion in solution. So meaning when a weak base dissociates, it somehow has to generate hydroxide. So for HF and its resulting conjugate base fluoride, how would that work? Let's treat F minus, which is a conjugate base, as its own unique weak base that dissociates in water. 
So I'm going to rewrite a new dissociation equation that shows my fluoride ion, my conjugate base, being dissolved or dissociating in water to establish a dissociation equilibrium. Because this is a base, we are going to be a proton acceptor. In this case, we are accepting a proton from water. So again, we're treating this like a weak base in its own right, not just a weak base that can react with the hydronium from the HF in the reverse. So we're thinking about like what is actually happening to fluoride in the beaker. When this happens, we regenerate molecular HF. But then also, since we deprotonated the water, that leaves behind hydroxide ion. So if this is indeed going to be called a bronsted lowry base, or excuse me, an Arrhenius base, or a base in general, it should increase the amount of hydroxide. So this was a result of us treating or looking at our base as its own weak base, undergoing its own weak dissociation in water. So when it comes to conjugate pairs, we can identify a substance based on what it does in the reverse reaction. So in our case here, the F minus ion acted as a proton acceptor from the hydronium. So that's what makes it a Bronsted-Lowry base. But then we can also ask ourselves, what does that substance do in water? Meaning, what does its own dissociation look like? So this is a way for us to prove again to ourselves that Ka and Kw are related. So if I knew the, that's right, base dissociation equation here. If I knew the acid dissociation constant for HF, this would have Ka, I believe it's like 2.4 times 10 to the negative four. Let's confirm that. No, 6.6 times 10 to the negative four. So that is the Ka for the weak dissociation of HF. Meaning then that this base fluoride ion has to have some associated Kb that describes it. So let's write out both our expressions for Ka and the product of Ka with Kb and see if this gives us Kw. So Ka, this is our product over aqueous reactant for the acid dissociation. So Ka would be concentration hydronium, concentration fluoride over concentration HF. So this is all from our acid, then Kb, well, we don't know the value, but we could write dissociation products over aqueous reactants, just like we would with any other kind of equilibrium sta um, state. So this would be concentration hydroxide times concentration HF over concentration F minus. So this is our base dissociation expression. Notice we have some terms that cancel here, HF over HF, F minus over F minus. This gives us concentration H3O plus times concentration OH minus. This is indeed our expression for Kw. So if I wanted to find what the value of this Kb term was, I would have to utilize the fact that Kb times Kw, sorry, Kb times Ka is equal to Kw. 
rearranging, I could say KB is equal to KW over KA. So that is 10 to the negative 14 over R 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative four. Let's figure out what that is real quick. Should be pretty small, especially compared to the KA. So 10 to the negative 14 divided by 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative four. Uh, I have an order of magnitude there. Negative 14, not negative four. Divided by 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative four. There we go. We get that KB is equal to 152, 1.52 times 10 to the negative 11. Again, very, very small because it is a conjugate. But we have just verified again for ourselves that the product of Ka and Kb equals Kw when we are talking about conjugate pairs. So the Ka is talking about the weak acid dissociation and Kb is considering the conjugate base of that weak acid establishing its own dissociation in water as described by some equilibrium constant, Kb. Okay. Let's see if this is useful at all. Like, let's see if we can't maybe like find an example or craft some kind of problem where this information is something that will make your life easier. So for example, What is the pH of a 0 0.0105 ammonia solution? And the KB of ammonia, I have that somewhere. I would have to give you this stuff unless I wanted you to solve for it. All right, let's pull it up real quick. It's actually, I think, pretty similar to that of acetic acid. Yeah, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay. All right. Let's start kind of pulling out information that we know. So I've got ammonia, which is a weak base. So let's see what happens if I put ammonia in water. Because this is a weak base, it is going to accept a proton from the surrounding water, becoming the ammonium ion, and creating the hydroxide ion. This is what, by definition, makes it a weak base. And we are trying to figure out the pH, so our goal is determine the pH of the solution, which is the negative log base 10 concentration of acid, H3O plus. So this, again, when we're like given a molarity of the weak substance, that is not necessarily equivalent to the molarity of the actual acidic or basic particle that that substance puts in solution when it dissociates. So I need to figure out what's happening at this dissociation equilibrium. So I'm going to create an ice table because again, anytime I'm trying to determine conditions at equilibrium, ice table is like the means that I have of doing that. And I know that initially I've got this concentration of ammonia. So that is my 0 0.0105 molar water 
we don't care about because it's condensed. Um, it's also present in a huge quantity. It's not really going to affect our equilibrium because its concentration is not going to change. So we do not include things like liquid solids in our equilibrium constants. And before any dissociation occurs initially, right, pre-equilibrium state, the concentration of our dissociation products is zero. We have none that's made. And everything in this dissociation equilibrium is a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. So I'm going to have some decrease in the concentration of ammonia X, resulting in some proportional increase in the concentration of NH4 and hydroxide ion. This is going to create 0 0.0105 minus X molar at equilibrium for my NH3, and then X molar of each of my respective products at equilibrium. And 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, that's on the verge of being close enough for the small x approximation. Like in my class, it'd be okay, but when you move on to OCHEM, just be careful. So I'm going to apply here the small x approximation. And ensure that you're checking what kind of constant you're given. So here we are given the base constant, which makes sense because this is a weak base. So now I have Kb is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, which is equal to x squared over 0 0.0105 if we're using the small x approximation. So then 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 times 0 0.0105. This gives us x squared is equal to 1.89 times 10 to the negative 7. Square root that. This gives us x is equal to 4.34. Four point three four seven four times ten to the negative four molar, and this is equal to our concentration of hydroxide. At equilibrium, and now I have two kind of paths in front of me that I could use to find the pH. Because remember, pH H is dependent on the concentration of acid. Here, I know my concentration of hydroxide. So I can either find pOH first and then get to pH. Or I can find Ka and establish my acid dissociation. So let's do the first method, pH is equal to the negative log of 4.3, so pOH, 4.3474 times 10 to the negative four. So negative log of 4.3474 times 10 to the negative four. pOH is equal to 3.3617. We know that pH and pOH sum to 14. So I can get pH by doing 14 minus pOH. So that's 14 minus 3.3617. This gives us 10.6. We have three sig figs from our initial molarity. This makes sense, we are a base, so we do have a basic pH. And now let's see how we could have maybe tackled this problem differently 
if we had started off with Ka in the first place. So kind of let's move option two. to use Ka first. So I can rewrite the conjugate basis dissociation. So this would be NH4 plus plus H2O. So we're treating our conjugate acid as an acid in its own right where it's dissociating in water. This reforms ammonia and creates our acid particle. I'm going to move this x squared over here. I'll just erase it. All right, we've got a relationship between Ka and Kb. So Ka times Kb is equal to Kw. So this means that Ka for the ammonium ions association is equal to Kw over Kb. So Ka is equal to our 10 to the negative 14. divided by our given Kb. I get a Ka is equal to 5.555 times 10 to the negative 10. And then I would set up this dissociation using an ice table, but in reverse. So let's see here. Before and then at equilibrium. Okay, if I know how much ammonium is going to be put into solution, then I have that concentration. So I could plug that in here. So that is 4.3474. And send a negative four molar. Zero, zero, minus x, x, x. Definitely going to apply the small x approximation here. And then once we have this, we could set up our Ka expression to be x squared over 4.3474. Times 10 to the negative 4 solve for x, and in this case, x would be our concentration of acid, and then we could use our straight up pH equation. So understanding this relationship between Ka, Kb, and Kw is another tool for you to kind of move around your perspective of what's happening in these acid-base associations, right? We're not limited to thinking about just pH. We can think about pOH. We can think about Kb or Ka. So just kind of keep in mind that there's this level of complexity in your beaker when you have a weak substance dissociating because its conjugate is present and it also undergoes its own dissociation in water. Now let's talk about pKa and pKb because these are important ideas for the next topic, which is buffers. So recall that for some substance and its conjugate, there exists some equilibrium dissociation constants 
KA and KB. So if I were thinking about just my weak acid dissociation, Move this over. There we go. This should be in water, H2O. I have my weak acid. And this dissociation is described by Ka. This has created a conjugate base, which I can write a dissociation equilibrium for in its own right as a base. So H2O is going to donate a proton. We're going to recreate molecular HA. And then we are also going to be left with OH minus. This is described by some equilibrium dissociation constant Kb, where again, the product of these two, if we're talking about the Ka of a weak acid and the Kb of its conjugate base is equal to Kw. And I could do the same thing for my weak base dissociation equation. So if I've got a weak base B, Dissociating in water, this becomes protonated to make BH plus and OH minus. So this is our weak base that is described by some KB. And it creates BH plus, the conjugate acid in solution. So let's write out the conjugate acid BH plus's dissociation in water to demonstrate that it is, in fact, an acid in that it will generate acidic particles in solution. This will become something that is deprotonated. So B and then H3O plus, that is our hydronium ion. So this is now described by some kind of Ka because we create an acid, we are a weak acid. So again, Ka times Kb is equal to Kw. As you've noticed, these values, Ka, Kb, and Kw, are really, really small, typically, when we're talking about a weak substance. Even, th even for like acids that are weak, but they have Ka's that won't really let us get away with the small x approximation, the Kb of their conjugate is going to be very tiny. And of course, Kw is 10 to the negative 14. That's incredibly small. So we often express Ka or Kb values in a logarithmic way. So by definition, to kind of like crunch down, so to speak, these really, really small orders of magnitude, we could define pKa and pKb, where pKa, remember this p means take the negative log base 10 of, so this is the negative log base 10 of Ka, and pKb is the negative log base 10 of Kb. So we're gonna utilize pKa and pKb coming up when we talk about buffer solutions. But the idea is that these are easier values to work with because they are not these like incredibly tiny fractions that we have to write, you know, an associated 10 to the negative with. So for example, the pKa of acetic acid would be the negative log base 10 of the Ka of acetic acid, which is the negative log base 10 of 1.8 times 10 to the negative five. 
So when we do that, negative log base 10 of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, we get a, let's make this arrow a bit bigger. pKa of 4.744. So you and I can conceptualize the number 4.7 a lot better than I think we can conceptualize 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. All right, so in our next video, we're going to bring all of this together, the idea of conjugates, their pKa and pKb values, and what happens when conjugates exist in beakers in non, like, ignorable ratios, like maybe like a 50-50 um, percent composition or something like that. And that's going to be our conversation about buffers. So see you in our next video where we discuss what a buffer solution is.